This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to you, Pat, DeGrasier Daniels, and Erwin Stirr. Coming up on DTNS is a call to pause AI research reasonable. A law aimed at TikTok could hit end-to-end -end encryption. And why does Italy hate mammoth meatballs? Or do they? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I am Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, co-host of Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod is the Will. Uh, Will Smith, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Let's start today's festivities with the quick hits. Apple announced its 34th annual Worldwide Developers Conference, a.k.a. WWDC, will be held Monday, June 5th through Friday, June 9th. As it's been the past few years, WWDC 2023 will be a mostly online event open to all developers at no cost. The company is also planning an in-person special event for certain developers and students on June 5th at the Apple Park campus. Windows Central sources say Microsoft began work on a project called Core PC. It's a modular and customizable variant of Windows. It would let Microsoft configure different editions of the operating system with different different levels of support for things like legacy Win32 apps, legacy features, compatibility. This would also let Microsoft ship a version of Windows that completely strips out legacy support, uh, which would be ideal for doing things like competing with Chrome OS. Microsoft is also working on a version that is silicon optimized to vertically focus on hardware with an emphasis on AI capabilities. Company reportedly hopes to have Core PC ready sometime in 2024. Google announced a new perspectives carousel that will show insights from a range of journalists, experts, and other relevant voices under top stories in search. For example, showing tweets and substack posts uh, below news articles about the Oscars. This will roll out soon in the U.S. for English language search. The company also announced it will roll out extreme heat alerts in search over the coming months, partnering with the Global Heat Health Information Network. As early as this year, Nokia plans to launch a 4G LTE network on the moon. I'm, I'm not joking. They're going to use a Nova C lunar lander launched on a SpaceX rocket and establish an LTE connection between the lander and a solar powered rover. Uh, this will demonstrate the ability of the network to work, and then it could be used on NASA's Artemis manned moon missions. The hardware still needs to be validated, so the launch could be delayed to 2024, but it's going to happen. And those missions, which I, I guess manned is, is an old fashioned word, uh, that are going to have men and women uh, will be able to have a nice T-Mobile connection. They the will moon. be personed. They will be personed. And Thank they you. will have internet access. Good stuff. The U.S. D uh, District Court for the Northern District of California issued a subpoena for information on the user called Free Speech Enthusiast who posted Twitter's source code to GitHub in early January. GitHub removed the code last Friday in response to a DMCA request from Twitter and now has until April 3rd to provide names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, social media profile data, anything, including an IP address, for users associated with free speech enthusiast accounts. GitHub was also ordered to provide that same info for any user who downloaded or modified the data. GitHub may challenge the order. And uh, thank you to S. Kelly 2909 in our chat. Crude is the appropriate word. C-R-E-W-E-D. -E That's what NASA uses. A, yes. a crew is on board the mission. Thank you very much, S. Kelly. All right, let's talk a little more about, uh, we got some follow-ups on TikTok. Yeah, we do. So a video and sharing, uh, image sharing app called Lemon8, that's L-E-M-O-N and the number eight, has climbed into the top 10 on the U.S. App Store's overall rankings this week. Described as a lifestyle community app with a similar look to Instagram. Now, don't worry if you haven't heard of it, because Data AI says this is the first time at Lemon 8 cracked the top 200 in the U.S. since it launched in March of 2020, kind of under the radar until fairly recently. Gizmodo notes that Lemon 8 is listed as owned by a Singapore-based company called Helophilia, but past reports have found that ByteDance is, in fact, Lemonade's parent company. So while a potential TikTok ban may loom, 
Is this a way around it? Yeah. Could ByteDance just uh, like promote these other smaller apps that nobody remembered they had? Maybe not. Uh, at least not if the Restrict Act passes. Now, yesterday we mentioned the Restrict Act as the leading contender to be a bill that could be used to ban TikTok. Uh, but we didn't talk as much about it yesterday because we were focused on explaining what was going on with TikTok itself. So it's worth taking the time today, since we have this lemonade story, to note the breadth of the Restrict Act. Uh, it is very widely applicable. It doesn't mention TikTok specifically. In fact, it gives the U.S. Secretary of Commerce the authority to take any mitigation measure. Now, it lays out a bunch of examples, but it also says, and any other kind of mitigation measure against any risk by a covered transaction that poses an undue or unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. So if somebody can make an argument it's a risk to national security, you can mitigate against it, including banning it. If it's a covered transaction, a covered transaction is one in which a foreign adversary or an entity subject to the jurisdiction of a foreign adversary has an interest. Foreign adversaries named in the bill, and they could be changed or added to over time, but the ones named in the bill include Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and Venezuela under President Maduro. So, for any reason deemed to be a threat to national security, any company which does business in Russia, which is Google, Apple, Microsoft, could conceivably be made to do almost anything with their tech. And of course, that applies to China too, where even more businesses do business. Uh, I, I feel like this, this makes me nervous, Will, because... You could see a route, and I know it's not intended to do this, but you could see a route where someone says, yeah, iMessage shouldn't be end-to-end -end encrypted, and we're going to use the Restrict Act to stop them from doing that because they do business in China, uh, and therefore they have to give us a backdoor to end-to-end -end encryption for national security reasons. Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the big issue with the with the legislation as far as I uh, as far as I understand it is that it's just entirely too open ended. It concentrates power in the executive branch, which, as we've all learned over the last few years, maybe is not a great idea as as you know based on the the outcomes of past elections, and it, it's it's the open ended nature and 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 kind of the fact that. Honestly, the problems with TikTok could be solved if we just had an actual data, you know, anti-data collection law like like has happened in the EU with GDPR and it kind of happened in California a few years ago. I was looking at the uh, the details of this act or this proposed act. And the one thing that threw me because my, my initial response was, hey, if they ban up ban TikTok, they end up banning it and it goes through a whole bunch of kids are going to learn how to use VPNs for the first time. And I was kind of joking about it, you know, ah, VPNs get you, get you around anything. But there is language in this thing that is like hardcore anti-VPN, not necessarily saying VPNs are outlawed or, out, you know, outlawed, no, but, but if you use a VPN and knowingly mm -hmm. use it to get attached to this or anything else that they deem a security risk and have banned, then you Huge yourself fines. may be a security risk. Yeah. yeah, you are subject to gigantic fines, long amounts of time in jail. Like a real gnarly look at the underbelly of what it takes to use a VPN if you're trying to get around these rules. And that stuff's a little scary, a little too much. I mean, I, I guess I, I wonder, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about Lemonade, uh, for example, uh, on the show today. Never heard of it. Um, even though it's been around since 2020, uh, do a bunch of people who are TikTok, you know, users and lovers who, I don't know, in a future, <laughs> not far away from now, uh, n no longer are able to use TikTok, just jump over to Lemonade. And if so, how long does it take for this cycle to repeat itself? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what happened in India, right? Uh, they started with a small number of apps, including TikTok, but they ended with more than 200. So yeah, Lemonade's not going to be a, a strategy for that. Uh, if this ends up banning TikTok, they're going to ban everything else by dances associated with anything else that has a trace to China as well. It's interesting that uh, it Lemonade looks like it's just a company in Singapore, so maybe it could skate by somehow on paperwork. I don't know. I mean, we're, There's going to be a lot of attempts on that. We're talking about the fact that they're not really skating by, so you know. Yeah, but where's know. the proof? I I, I think it, yeah. it's a little nebulous. So you could see them doing other things where they have paper companies with relationships, etc. Uh, it's it, it's going to get like that, 
and you're going to have other ways to get around. One side rules. note, that app would need a serious overhaul. I've I've used that app and Lemonade is not TikTok like even close to it. It is a lot closer. No, to, it's not meant to be. Yeah. It's like more like Instagram mm -hmm. eight years ago is really what it's like. They don't even have yeah. a really good video Actually system. Actually sounds in there. like a pretty good app. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> that's a decent point. So yeah, that's the other thing is I just, I think people end up going to shorts and reels and then Shorts and Reels also scramble a bit because they have a lot of repurposed TikTok accounts. That's exactly so. what happened in India. Everybody, everything, there was a few startups that got a little bit of traction, but most everybody went to YouTube and Instagram. Yep. There it is. Well, earlier this week, Ubisoft pulled out of E3 after Nintendo and Microsoft both said they would not be at the physical show either. You might recall just last month, Ubisoft was the first major company to publicly commit to E3, but then announced it will instead hold an Ubisoft Forward live event on June 12th in Los Angeles. Now, Sega and Tencent have both announced they don't plan to officially participate in E3 either. Organizer Reed Pop says the full roster of exhibitors will be announced in the lead up to the expo. E3 is going to take place June 13th through the 16th and is the event's first physical show at the LA Convention Center in four years. So it's a big deal that they're back in person. It's also changed hosting hands from the Entertainment Software Association to what Sarah just mentioned, Read Pop, which also puts on PAX, EGX, the Star Wars celebration. So it's safe to say a lot of things about E3 are going to be different this year. But is it really that different that these companies aren't involved? I know everybody's making a big deal about it, but did we forget in four years that companies often hold events outside of big conventions? Microsoft does that at CES, has done it for years. I'm curious how big of a deal this is really. Scott, what's your read on E3? Well, uh, for me, it you you kind of described it, and I, I'll, I'll put the blame at Nintendo's feet. Um, they, they, years and years ago, decided to stop exhibiting or not necessarily exhibiting, but stop doing keynotes and sort of joining in on the usual E3 business and started doing directs. And it turns out, uh, in some ways, that was a prophetic move, and everybody else is doing that now as well. And I think when they are now being asked, hey, do you want to come spend literally for these companies, some of them, millions of dollars on exhibiting here and doing your stage presentation here? Or would you rather control everything about it, do videos of your own, choose your own dates, do your own thing? They're choosing the latter. And I don't think I blame them. E3 no longer is a place where you, that's the only place you're going to get your word out. The internet is where you get your word out and you will easily get your word out with one state of play from Sony or Microsoft saying one thing about Starfield or, or Nintendo doing a direct. The whole world stops. We all listen, the gaming world anyway. And we're not that fussed that we don't have E3 as the one time a year that it happens. Plus I mean, you look at PAX, plus you look at mm -hmm. the Game Awards, you look at all these other events. GDC kind of takes care of the developers and DICE sort of does that as well. So what are you left with? What are you actually exhibiting there? And I'm not sure they know. It, this kind of reminds me of when Apple uh, pulled out of Macworld and everyone was like, wow, Macworld. I mean, Macworld RIP. But yeah, it was yeah. Macworld continued on for some time. You know, after Apple said, eh, we're just not going to be officially part of this. We're still talking about Apple at the event. And I wonder if E3 still benefits from all of the news and, you know, forthcoming announcements from these major players that don't have a booth at E3 but still are going to sort of propel the conversation. I mean, there's there's two things to remember here about E3, right? E3 has been dying for as long as I can remember now. We've been talking about E3 dying for like 10, 15 years true. at this point. <laughs> so it got true. real small for a little bit, then it got big again, and then yeah. we had the coronavirus, and everybody was like, why do we even have E3 anymore? So so it's it's been in a perpetual state of flux ever since gaming became a mainstream hobby that everybody participates in. You know, in, in the 90s, it made sense to have these huge events where, you know, millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people came, and there were opportunities for you know the national news people to come and do a package about the hot new trend in video games we don't need that anymore everybody's playing everybody's playing whether it's match threes on your phone or or halo or destiny or whatever everybody plays games so so people know about games we're good yeah the, and also we what we do want is we want community right and that's yeah. happening that's happening maybe in other areas that's mm -hmm. maybe the one place the esa and e3 missed the boat is not counting on that being the future i think the that's why forward. they hired yeah. read pop isn't it yeah yeah for sure well 
it's too big for indies and it's too small for the main street for for people that are already established like nintendo doesn't need anything to get breath of the wild information no. out we're all there lined up ready to go so you know it's it's a weird place to be i hope that they shift to be more consumer focused like pax and and egx and that kind of stuff uh rather than an industry event because i think i think the space for that as an industry event has kind of gone away yeah uh, well, folks, uh, if you like these uh, kinds of conversations, uh, we'd like you to su submit ideas for them. What do you want to hear us talk about? Let us know on our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. The Future of Life Institute published an open letter asking for a pause in training AI systems that are more powerful than GPT-4. The letter said, quote, Powerful AI systems should be developed only once. We are confident that their effects will be positive and their risks will be manageable, end quote. The letter also called for a voluntary pause, but said governments should step in if it's not enacted quickly. The letter goes on to describe the need to develop AI governance systems, including independent review and oversight systems, saying, we can now enjoy an AI summer in which we reap the rewards, engineer these systems for the clear benefit of all, and give society a chance to adapt. Uh, more than a thousand people have signed the letter, but keep in mind that anyone is allowed <laughs> to sign it. Uh, you, you can just type your name in. Uh, and apparently at one point someone had had typed in Altman's name uh, and they had to remove it. Uh, but the first names on the list are legit. The first two names are computer scientist Yashua Bengio, who was instrumental in hiring the team that started OpenAI, by the way. He uh, teaches at the University of Montreal. Stuart Russell from UC Berkeley is the second signatory. Uh, the next two names are the ones getting all the attention, Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak. Other notable signers include former U.S. presidential candidate Andrew Yang, Stability AI's founder and CEO Ahmed Mostak, and co-founders of the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris and Alza Roskin, uh, as well as a couple of engineers from Google and Meta sprinkled in there. However, nobody from OpenAI, nobody even from Anthropic, with, which spun out of OpenAI to build a safer chatbot, has signed the letter. I think the letter is reasonable. I, I've seen so many people shred it, including folks in our chat room right now. Uh, keep in mind, they aren't saying stop all development on AI. They're saying take six months before you start working on the next version, like GPT-5. And, and Altman actually told the Wall Street Journal today, uh, we haven't started work on GPT-5. He said, you're preaching to the choir. So I don't actually think what's in this letter is that unreasonable. It's saying, let's take a pause before we move to the next stage and all agree on guardrails. That would be perfectly reasonable if it wasn't such a one-sided list of people who are not the people developing this. It's not Google, it's not Facebook, it's not OpenAI, uh, and, and it's not DeepMind uh, or, or any of the other developers in here. So it seems like an emotional fight, and that's how people are treating it. When I read the text of it, it doesn't seem as crazy. Do you agree, folks? Let's start with you, Will. I, I mean, look, I've spent a fair amount of time using GPT-4, and the big problem with it right now is it's it's kind of like the early, like the mid-90s, early 2000s internet, right? It's in the extreme mansplaining phase. So it is able to give a believable, really enthusiastic defense of whatever you ask it. It will explain stuff. It will be completely wrong in the important details, both minor and major of everything that it describes. And as a result, you can get some really convincing information that is a hundred percent untrue, which is, I think, the danger. One of the dangers here. If people use this like they use search results. They're gonna people are gonna end up dead. It's like bad things are going to happen to people. It's gonna take people's jobs. It's gonna replace it with bad information. And and like, I don't see a downside to to taking a pause, except for that, like you said, half of the world isn't gonna pause and the other half will, and then the half that pauses is six months or whatever behind. Well, but else. again, the other half is saying like, I don't even know why we need this letter. We pause, we haven't started work on the next version of it anyway. I, I do, what I don't like is that they're fighting about it. To me, it's like, yeah, you should just all have come together and agreed on it. Why does it have to be this threatening uh, open letter? Well, and I think that, that that's the thing about this that is implied is that GPT five, six, seven, whatever it is, is going to harm us because we don't understand it well enough. 
you know, mm. let's stick with GPT-4 and let's really get our heads around it and figure out, you know, when the system works, when it doesn't, how it helps us, when it's uh, dangerous, um, you know, or, or, you know, threatens humanity. Because that's sort of, the, that that's the overall type thing here, right? Is like, robots will take over, we're not going to be able to stay on top of it, and everything is going to go to, you know, you know where. So, uh, I... I don't really feel like the letter is in the wrong, but just being eviscerated, you know, online by a lot yeah. of really smart people saying it's too late. Yeah. We're already doing this. Like what, you know, but what are we talking about? That's the hmm. part that really frustrates me. Is there, the letter isn't asking us to stop doing what we're already doing. The letter is saying before you do the next one. Before you uh -huh. make it better, before you do GPT-5, which you haven't started working on, let's all agree on the rules of the road to have some systems to oversee things, to, to, to make sure that we can tell if it is going off the rails and stop it from doing that. I don't think that's unreasonable. No, it's not unreasonable to ask. But here's where I think the problem is. None of the people actually making the stuff are agreeing with the letter, and people who mm -hmm. aren't directly involved are the ones telling them to, which smells a lot like eventually you're going to get that sort of thing from governments. You're going to get that from other regulatory bodies. So if it was me and I was in the AI world, I was a, a founder and a, and a huge investor in OpenAI or any of these companies, I would want me and everyone like me to come together and figure out your own solution of self-regulation start figuring out what those issues are those questions are those problems are make that a priority you've got the money you can hire the talent make that a, t a priority before somebody else makes the priority for you and 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 that way you will just avoid a ton of these uh, these headaches you make it very independent and transparent you do it the way they tried to do the esrb back in the 90s with video games talked about it on tms with tom a little bit today you can go listen to that if you want to hear detail but point is do you do you want to control your destiny the best way to do it is get out in front of it so that others aren't telling you how to do it and that genie's out of the bottle for sure but i think we can i don't know we can make sure the genie's well dressed and behaves itself <laughs> but doesn't you know I mean? but doesn't that just introduce the whole sort of like well you scott and i and tom and will all agree that this is the best way to proceed forward what about all the other people who have access to the same tools who don't agree so, so, so I, I mean, I think the 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 thing that is confusing and difficult about this topic for for me personally is that it's advancing so fast right now that it's hard to keep up with what it's good and bad at, right? And and if it continues increasing in this pace, like the, what was the gap between GPT three and GPT four? It was like six months or something, right? It was yeah, incredibly it was, short, yeah. very quick. Less than oh no, no, it was much longer than that. But it was, was a it? gap between the introduction of Chat GPT and GPT four. Okay. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm honestly, I'm more concerned. I'm less concerned about OpenAI because we can see what they're doing. They're posting their stuff publicly. We can all log in and, 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 and try it out and see how it works and what it's good at. The, the thing that scares me is what the companies that aren't sharing their work and aren't showing their work are doing. And, and, you know, are we, is OpenAI the cutting edge or are they lagging behind everybody else? And we don't really, nobody's in a place to know because yeah. nobody shares their information. I, well, and that's what this letter is calling for. I think the only problem with this letter is that it's not consensus building. It's got Elon Musk who, you know, depending on who you believe, got kicked out of OpenAI because he wanted to take over and they didn't want him to. Uh, that's what Business Insider sources say or Semaphore sources say that too. Uh, so it, it feels like it's a fight that, that's being picked over something that everyone should agree on. Uh, to me, it's uncontroversial to say, hey, GPT-4, man, it's moving really fast. This is really w weird. Uh, we don't even know what all the fallout of that is yet. Maybe we should come up with a framework for safely moving into GPT-5 rather than doing what we did with technology all through the 2000s and 2010s, which was just for try stuff and then see how it affected the world. Uh, I, I think that's a reasonable statement. It's just maybe not the right messengers to bring it. Yep. Well, I don't know how hungry everybody is on this panel. Pretty hungry. Uh, well, good, Tom. <laughs> You're, you, you may or may not like this next story then. An Australia company called Val says it has used a combination of woolly mammoth DNA and African elephant DNA to create a lab-grown woolly mammoth meatball. <laughs> now, you might say, how does it taste? No one knows. Uh. Uh, certain safety measures have to be in place before any of us can taste it. And if Italy has its way, 
We won't taste it ever. Uh, Italy's Prime Minister, Georgia Maloney, is among those who have backed a bill in the country that would ban lab-produced meat and other foods like lab-produced fish, synthetic milk, stuff that you sometimes see on on counters, uh, depending on where you live. Presumably, also would ban woolly mammoth meatballs in order to protect the Italian agriculture industry. If the bill passes, breaking the ban could mean fines of up to 60,000 euros. Ooh. I mean, did they have to choose, did they have to call it a meatball? Because I think that fired up the Italians, you know? Well, yeah, actually, like we, we are putting these stories together. The Italians aren't targeting the meatball. The Italians are basically saying, listen, yeah. we, we do food. This is what yeah. we do. The Italians are Don't saying any lab grown farmers. meat. Yeah, meatball yeah. or otherwise. Okay, Doesn't, but yeah. can I be the first to say I would totally eat this meatball? No problem. Let's go. I'm ready. Your lab meat. Are you I'm sure? Ready. This is a protein that has not existed in nature for, for millennia. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I, w- I, w- I would eat it. Yeah. Me and 100%. Sarah, we're in. Well, yeah. Why I'm not? a little, I mean, honestly, I'm a little stopped by the elephant DNA. I don't know if I feel like it's. Uh, <laughs> You're more worried about the elephant to, DNA. <laughs> to, to build a taste for elephant flesh when they're so endangered. But it's lab grown, yeah. Will. It's lab yeah. grown. Look, tastes you like know, elephant. No elephants were harmed in the <laughs> making of this meatball. Once Musk gets the first taste of his, of his lab grown oh, elephant gosh. meatball, he's going to be like, I want to see if it tastes like the real thing. Sarah, and that's how yeah. it all ends. Yeah. It's bad news for the elephants. <laughs> also, uh, Italy's fighting a losing battle because Europe's going to pass legislation that says you can do lab-grown meat because they're going to be pressured to do so for animal cruelty reasons, and then Italy's going to have to go along. So, I, uh, you know. Uh, well, yeah. and, and also the carbon footprint of lab-grown meat should theoretically be a lot lower than, than you know, the, yeah. growing your it, It's quite likely that it, it could be, and if it is, then there's another point in its, in its favor. Yeah. Uh, I, too, am very curious what the mammoth meatball tastes like, but that's a press stunt. They're never going to make these meatballs for people to eat. Yeah. Listen, you know, we're we're eating, you know, impossible meat. Uh, we're doing lab-grown chicken nuggets. Bring on the woolly meatball. The woolly gonna mammoth guess. meatball is going to end up in a museum in the Netherlands, by the way. That's not, I'm not go. joking. That's actually what, what it's, nobody's going to eat it. It's just going to be preserved for science. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> My prediction is that stuff's going to taste exactly like venison it's gonna be like deer meat so oh get that's ready. too gamey mm. for me well mm. i'm telling you yeah. these mastodon balls you, you all can have my not a mastodon not a mastodon a ma- sorry oh, that's we've different. been through this yeah, yeah. we've been through this not a megalodon none of that <laughs> yep. all right yep. uh, so, <laughs> not, not a i big, would eat megalodon meatballs not a big dinosaur too. shark yeah. either yeah uh all right let's check out the mailbag uh, let's do it so matia had some thoughts on text-to-speech tools which we talk about on the show regularly, and who they can help. Matias says, text-to-speech tools are not just helpful for classic screen readers users, those with low or no vision, but they're also helpful for people with dyslexia or those learning to read a new language. An AI-powered tool that can do dynamic reading based on the context, like a professional audiobook reader, would be great. Text-to-speech devices are monotone. They pose difficulties if you have some level of attention deficit disorder, say, or are dealing with a very dry subject. Uh, this is a great point. Thank you, uh, Mattia. This is relating to you know the idea of, of, of having AI create audiobooks that we talked about earlier this week. Uh, a, a nice point. Thank you, Mattia, for writing in. And thank you, Will Smith, uh, for being here. Before we get out of here, let folks know what you're up to these days. Uh, I mean, we're just over at the Tech Pod, uh, TechPod.content.town. Uh, Brad and I uh, post a podcast every week. Uh, I think last week was the mailbag. The week before that, we talked about uh, old technology, uh, in, in, like uh, 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 look. We talked about the MS DOS icon from Windows ninety five nice. for a long time. I'm just nice. gonna say, you've just touched really the hearts of many icon. people in the like, DNS oh, audience. Yeah. yeah, remember yes. that? That's it awesome. Feelings. Why did it look like that? Who knows? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Will, so glad to have you on the show today. Also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us. Let folks know where they can keep up with you. Sure. I always love being on with Will because it gets me excited about video games. And if you're excited about video games, then you might like my show, Core, which airs on Thursdays. We go deep into the big issues of the day and the little games we're playing and everything in between. It's a big, long show that just talks about your favorite hobby. So if you're into that, go check it out. Core, wherever you get your podcast, or you can find us at frogpants.com slash core. Well, thanks to both of you for being with us. Also, a very special thanks to Who is David? We don't know 
But we sure love having you as one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support. Who is David? Who is David? David's our best friend. David's our boss. That's right. That's who David is. Uh, David is also a patron and so gets to stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, This is not only a tease to Good Day Internet, it's also a bit of a content warning uh, because we're going to extend that lab-grown meat question uh, to the idea of human. So if you're curious about that, what we think about that, stick around (laughs) for Good Day Internet. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>